Good morning, internet peoples, uh, wherever you are. If you're uh, if you're tuning in, uh, welcome. It's good to have you here. Um, this is uh, the Larson Hicks show slash podcast slash vlog, whatever you want to call it. Um, and uh, today it's uh, it's uh, it's February first, so happy February to you. Um, and today I want to talk about liturgy. I want to talk uh, specifically about our liturgy at our church. Um, I am, uh, we go to Trinity Reformed Church. There it is. Um, and this is our bulletin. This is our program. If you come to church at our at, at Trinity, you're going to pick one of these up at the front. And you've got a really simple liturgy pl- uh, printed here. And so I kind of want to go through this. This is something that in the early days... I used to uh, frequently give uh, my spiel, as I'd call it, um, try to give a high-level overview of why we worship the way we worship, and uh, it's been a minute since I've done that, and I, and I also um, tend to do that during the announcements and don't feel like I have a ton of time to get into a lot of detail, so I, I'm going to record this with the hope that I can kind of dive a little deeper, um, and so I hope this is helpful. The, 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 the goal here is just to kind of reflect on um, why we worship the way we worship, um, and uh, what the different elements mean, why, why we do things the way we do things. Um, so just, yeah, kind of high level. So I'll start by saying, well, what is liturgy? Like liturgy is maybe a term that you're not familiar with. I didn't grow up in churches that use the term liturgy. Um, every church has a liturgy. Um, so it's this isn't like a, I've heard it, you know, people will say, are you a liturgical church? Well, all churches are liturgical churches because a, a liturgy is just your order of worship. It's just the structure. And I don't care what church you go to, a super charismatic, super home churchy, whatever you, you want to, wherever it is you go, there is a, a, a normal order of things that happens. Um, whether they put it down, you know, helpfully in a bulletin or not, there's a structure to the way that you worship. And and so the question right out of the gates is, okay, so it's not, it's, it's kind of an inescapable concept. It's not a matter of whether or not you're going to have a, a way to worship a structure. It's, it's really a matter of which, which way are you going to pick? How are you going to do it? And, uh, there's a lot of ways to approach it. Um, the, uh, the, the reason that we do things the way we do things, um, is because, we believe that this pat that they're actually that scripture actually has a lot to say on the topic of of worship of how to worship. Um, the problem with a lot of uh, churches these days is they want to limit the scriptures input on the topic of worship to only the New Testament. Uh, only the New Testament, like we're a New Testament church, which means we're only going to look to examples we see in the New Testament. The problem with that is that like there are whole books of the Bible that are dedicated to worship. Um, you know, Leviticus and the Psalms and 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 throughout uh, the Old Testament, there's there's plenty of other places that have a lot to say and a lot of examples. You know, I think about in uh, you know um, the story of Nehemiah. You know, you've got you've got stories of you've got an example of a liturgy of a worship service there. So so we actually have tons of examples, tons of um, information to draw on, lots of very specific information to draw on. And obviously, Christ is the once-for-all sacrifice. So we we've done away with, you know, the sacrificial system, but um, there's no there's no reason whatsoever to believe that we've also done away with every aspect of of worship. Um, and Christ even you know, gives commandments and talks about worship. You know, he talks about if you come to the, if you have a, an issue with your brother, you know, um, leave your leave your gift on the altar and and come back. So, so he's talking about you know this practice of giving a gift at the altar or or, or making an offering. I'm gonna take my hat off. Um, my hair was wet and I was kind of letting it dry, but I think we're good. Um, so, um, so yeah, so that's the. Uh, so anyway, so so we we look to the whole scripture uh, for for guidance on on worship, and uh, and then uh, I'd say that that the church historically has actually done a pretty phenomenal job of structuring a worship service that's patterned after uh, what we see in the Bible, um, and so it's interesting because I, I I collect old uh, I've whenever we go to uh, 
a garage sale or something, I will frequently, uh, if I see a hymnal, I'll pick it up because I, I just like looking through old hymnals and seeing, checking out songs that maybe I'm not familiar with. And it's interesting because you pick up an old Methodist uh, hymnal, you pick up an old um, Baptist hymnal, and you're going to see printed frequently in the back a liturgy, a standard liturgy. And it's it's basically exactly what we've got here. So this sort of like jettisoning of, of any structure or, 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 of, or of any kind of biblical um, pattern to the worship service um, is a very new thing in America. Like we've, we've most of the church throughout history and even in America up until, you know, a hundred or less, really 50 years ago, um, people basically throughout the world followed a structure just like this. And so, so for one, this is not like some innovation. This is a kind of a returning to the old ways, um, returning to the paths that, that really many in the church have never left. Um, but uh, for us Protestant, you know, folks like me who grew up Baptist, this is this is actually all kind of new. So, so that's one thing. Um, if you're interested in this topic, I'm gonna probably reference this a bunch of times. But um, uh, Jeff Myers uh, wrote a book called The Lord's Service. Um, I'll I'll put a link in the description. Uh, that's phenomenal on this topic. If if you're just wanting to dive deeper into it, that's the book that really got me excited about liturgy. Um, and, uh, and, uh, really made a compelling case to me biblically for, for having this kind of structure. Um, um, and he, he talks about, he kind of argues specifically for this idea of, of covenant renewal, um, that that's really what we're, what we're doing in a worship service. We're, we're taking this pattern that you see in every, every instance where God is making a covenant with his people in scripture, there is this pattern. Um, and, and it's mirrored in the five sacrifices, um, that are, that are commanded in scripture, uh, to be made, uh, in the temple. Um, you know, the burnt offering, the, the guilt, the, the sin offering, um, the, the peace offering, all of these different, um, sacrifices and, and offerings, um, they also follow this covenant pattern, this pattern of that God ha- has has established in all the different covenants that He's made with with Adam, with uh, with Noah, with Abraham, with with David, and so and so uh, that's it, it. Just kind of reinforces it, but it also like if you're just interested in covenants and understanding what a covenant is, his first uh, the first chapter, maybe it's even the introduction of that book lord service by by jeff myers does a pretty phenomenal job of just laying out what what is a covenant and what does a covenant look like um so i highly recommend that book if you're interested in this topic and want to dive deeper um the word liturgy and i'm not gonna back this up but you'll have to trust me the word liturgy means uh, the work of the people um and so um I think that's an important thing to mention at the outset that that liturgy is not this performance that the that the officials of the worship service the 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 pastors the ordained people that they that they sort of officiate or that they um, they enact this this kind of act or this dance or whatever it's it it it's the work of the people it is it is the um, the act of, of worshiping and bringing a, a sacrifice of praise to God. Um, and so, so that's, that's maybe one of the first things to mention is that the whole point of this structure is that this isn't a performance. This isn't somehow the modern church has, has landed on a liturgy, uh, where you come in, you go to a rock concert followed by a Ted talk and, and it's, it's, it's Pat, you as a, as an audience member are mostly passive in the process. You just watch and listen. Um, you don't really participate. You may stand for part of it. You may sit for part of it, but that's, that's the extent of your participation. Um, and so the idea of the work of the people, you know, the, the liturgy being, what is it that the people, uh, are doing, the congregation is doing that's kind of been lost. It's become in the modern church really more about what's happening on stage uh, we even design our churches, you know, to, to be more like a movie theater. You know, the lights are dim, there's lights on stage and you got a guy with a microphone and it's, and there's a bunch of lights shining on him. 
and that's kind of the the we've we've sort of borrowed that structure from from rock concerts and and uh, and um, you know like I said TED talks or, or lectures and so um, and so I think that's one thing to, to just be cognizant of is like okay there isn't really a liturgy in the sense that people are involved um, in the tri- in, in modern worship services and uh, and and it's um, and it's kind of I think if you were to ask someone hey justify that biblically why is it that you do that you'd be able to talk about singing and worship um and you'd be able to talk about preaching the word um but beyond that the rest of the structure the details why do we have a fog machine why do we have colored lights why do we dim the lights uh, why does everyone just sit passively and listen well um there 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 there, there isn't going to be much of a biblical justification for that okay so uh there's a there's a little introductory comment so so here are the five um, the five sections, uh, and again these, like I said, they correspond with the five um, sacrifices or offerings in uh, in Scripture, and they correspond with the structure of, of uh, the covenant. Um, let me let me just mention this uh, before I dive into the details. Uh, covenant renewal. So the idea that Jeff's kind of uh, Pastor Myers is, is making in his book is is that. A covenant is God coming to his people uh, of his own initiative. He is um, he is dealing with our sin, um, and then he is uh, he's consecrating us by his word. He's 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 uh, teaching us about the covenant, about the blessings and the curses of the covenant, about who he is and his character, and then he is. Um, and then he is, there's some sort of sign, there's some sort of um, sign that's connected to this promise that he's making. Um, and then he is uh, ascending us out. Um, the a covenant as, a, I think, I've heard Doug Wilson describe it this way, and I think he got it from somewhere. Maybe he's kind of modified someone else's definition, but he calls it, a covenant is a, uh, let's see if I get this right, a self-maledictory oath with attendant blessings and curses. Um, so, so God obviously makes covenants covenants. And so that's a sovereignly initiated, uh, self maledictory oath with attendant curses and blessings, but I could covenant with somebody else and, 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 and it be, um, it can have those same structures. So self maledictory, meaning, um, you're saying may, may something bad happen to me if, if this doesn't, if, if, if I don't keep the covenant. So, you know, the example is like, um, with Jacob, uh, I believe Jacob, um, he's, uh, he's told to split the, the animal in half and then a, 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 a flaming, uh, a, 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 a tongue of flame, uh, essentially passes through the, the two halves. And that's a, that's a sign of God saying, may this happen to me. And that's what you do. They call it cutting a covenant. Um, so you cut a covenant, you, you are, are, are cutting an animal in half and, and the, and the, and those who are making the covenant pass through it. And, and they're saying, may this happen to me. May I be cut in half and killed, um, if I break this covenant. And I heard somebody, um, make a really great point. Oh, I think this was in a uh, Wiley's book on, um, man of the house. He talks about, you think about, um, you know, covenants, are not something we necessarily do. I mean, we make contracts in business, but but making a covenant, you think think about living in the wilderness in Abraham, Isaac, Jacob's times, right? You've got roving bands of who knows what out there in the world, and you are um, you are you're vulnerable, right? And you depend on your neighbors um, for for to look out for you. And if they see some band of, you know, of bad guys, some, some, uh, uh, Huns or whatever, um, cruising through the, the wilderness headed your way, um, are they going to ignore it and get out of Dodge or are they going to, going to help? And, and so the idea is like, you, you actually really depended upon your neighbors and it was a blood oath. I mean, you were saying, look, May may you come and and strike me and my family down if I don't hold up my end of the bargain. Um, that if if somebody turns up, 
that I'm going to be there. I'm going to have your back and vice versa. This is a promise we're making to each other. So it's actually a big deal. It's not like a, it's not like a, a handshake. It's, it's a lot more serious than that. Um, and, and God's covenant with Noah, he puts the bow in the, in the sky and, and it's a, it's a bow that's pointing back up to God. It's like an arrow pointing back up at God, bow and arrow. And God's, God's saying the same thing. Look, I'm, I'm never going to do this again. And, and if, if I break this promise, you know, may, may the bow, you know, the arrow strike me. Um, okay. So that's what a covenant is. Um, and the idea is that, and, and I like to use the example of, of, of marriage, you know, marriage is a covenant. Um, there's oaths and there's promises, there's vows that are made. And I like to look, think of it that way. Uh, and obviously marriage, we have precedent for thinking about our relationship, the church's relationship to God in terms of marriage. We're told explicitly to do that in the new Testament. So, um, so in, in a, in a, in a real way, what, what worship is on Sunday, what worship is supposed to be is it is a, it's like renewing your marriage vows. God is, God is calling us and saying, I want to renew my vows with you. I want to, I want to recapitulate my love for you. I want to recapitulate my commitment to you. And I want to, you know, in marriage, you know, sort of the consummation of a marriage is the, the sexual act. Well, in, in, in our vow with, in our, in our covenant with God, um, his, the, the consummation is his giving of him, his flesh and blood, uh, to his people. So it, we are taking his flesh and blood into us. Um, and that is the sign that is the mark. This is a memorial, right? Jesus says. Um, and, and so that that's what's happening. Uh, and so, and so that's the pattern is we're saying this worship service is God calling us and re re, uh, renewing his, his vows to his people. And, and, um, and so we're, we're, uh, we're celebrating that we're participating in that. So that's the idea of covenant renewal. That's the concept is, is that this worship service is a covenant renewal worship service. Okay. So the five sections here are call, confession, consecration, communion, and commissioning. Uh, somehow someone somewhere uh, came up with the helpful five C's, um, which helps, helps, helps you memorize it. Um, Call, confession, communion, excuse me, call, confession, consecration, communion, and commissioning. So those are the five uh, correlating um, uh, aspects of the worship service that, that, that correspond to uh, the five sacrifices. So the call, um, the call is where, where God, uh, God initiates this thing. Uh, and, and so we, we lead with, with scripture you know, in our worship service. So we stand, the minister, the leader says, grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. So God is, God is sending his grace, mercy, and peace. Uh, he's, he, it's him that's doing it. And the people say, and also to you. Um, and then we read from scripture, a, a call to worship from scripture. And then we lift up our, and then we say, lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. And so this is God's people ascending into his presence, into his throne. He's calling, we're responding um, and coming before his throne. Um, we sing, we pray and we sing um, a joyful you know, call to worship type song. And then the very next thing we do, the first thing we do after we've we've been called and, and summoned uh, into God's presence is we have to deal with our, our sin has to be dealt with. Um, you know, scripture is full of, of, uh, of this uh, idea that God cannot uh, fellowship with um, with uh, sin, and so we have to be made holy, um, and so we have a confession of sin. And the way that we do it at our church is we have a, an exhortation. This is a part of the service that we dedicate five to ten minutes to a a specific message, a specific um, exhortation that's given by one of the leaders in the church um, about a particular sin. So, uh, the shepherds of the church, the, the, the men who have been charged by God with, with shepherding the flock, uh, you think about what, what's it, what's the job of a shepherd? Well, it's to, 
it's to keep the flock from together. It's to keep the flock from wandering off a cliff or getting stuck in a ditch. Uh, when, when that happens to go pursue that, that one, leave the 99, pursue the one, get them back. Um, but also the shepherd is to, uh, is to, um, throw rocks at wolves and bears and, and, and threats that, that are also in the church. And so the exhortation serves as, as you know, it's the rod and the staff. It's the, it's, it's, it's corralling the, the flock and getting the flock, um, away from danger. You know, Hey, let's stay away from this danger. Let's stay away from this danger. But it's also, it's also designed to be the kind of thing that, that if there's a wolf in sheep's clothing in the church, they're going to hear this and be offended and, 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 and be run off. You know, we, we want to. And so when we give an exhortation, I think one of the temptations probably that a lot of churches have if they do this sort of thing is going to be to, to spend a lot of time talking about the sins out in the world, right? The sins of other people, the sins of other churches or other you know, of, of the culture. And that's not what we're trying to accomplish at all here. Um, this is not about everyone else's sin. This is about our sin. And so as, as shepherds of our flock, we're always asking the question, what do our people, what are our people struggling with? What do our people need encouragement and exhortations about? Right. And so that's how we think as, as pastors or as, 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 um, shepherds, as elders of this church, um, we're thinking about what what do our people need to hear about. I gave an exhortation last week on why young families should um, should consider uh, doing a babysitter swap with each other, which sounds like a weird exhortation. There's there you know I've given exhortations on sarcasm um, in the home. I've given exhortations about all all manner of things, but. But that came directly out of a, an elder meeting where we were talking about about community and we were talking about young families and and I had this wonderful experience uh, and so um, it was like you know what that should be we should encourage the church uh, we should encourage with so many young families in our church that we should encourage should specifically directly encourage them to do this um, and so that's what we did in the exhortation so exhortation is designed to be God's word about a specific sin that's designed to, to, to bring to your attention an awareness of, of your sin. And then there's a time of confession um, and uh, uh, where we pray. And, and we actually kneel for confession. And the idea is, uh, is that um, our bodies matter, um, our posture matters. You know, when you're, when you're giving, a, when you're, um, giving a instructions to your kids and they're looking all over or they're, you know, uh, on the ground playing with toys or something, they're not listening. Right. And, and they, they, the sound waves may be hitting their eardrums, but they're not actively listening with the intent to obey. Right. Um, the Hebrew word for, for, uh, uh, Deuteronomy six, the, the sh- is called the Shema, right? It's, it's the word here, but the, but the, the Hebrew word is hear and obey. Um, so, so it's 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 a word that actually means more than just simply hear. It's a word that that implies hearing with the intent to obey. Um, and so, um, and so we're pr- we're kneeling because we are uh, because whether we feel it or not, uh, we ought to be contrite. Uh, we ought to be broken over our sin. And sometimes, um, sometimes your posture reflects what's going on in your heart. Uh, Other times your posture helps, um, helps remind you, you know, helps uh, direct your heart. Your body is the best, greatest and best tool that God has given you to aid you in righteousness. Right. And I think that that's a, that's probably an unpopular thought or, or especially for us, you know, there's a lot of us who are who are kind of Platonists, where we think that you know what, or we're we're Gnostics, where we think the body is bad, entirely bad, the physical is bad, and only the spiritual is good. Um, but God gave you a body um, as a as a tool, as an instrument for righteousness, and and it and it can be an absolutely wonderful tool to help you get your head in the right place. And so. We kneel um, because we need to be reminded and humbled that that over our sin, um, 
before God. And so it's an appropriate posture when you're, when you're coming into God's presence and you're confessing your sin, it's an, it's the right posture of, uh, to, to take. And so that's why we kneel. We don't do it because, you know, it's some tradition that, that, or, or whatever to try to be cool or something. It's, it's, it's all about, um, we're trying to, um, to, to be sincere in our, in our confession. Um, so we have a time of confession, and it's it's brief. It's a prayer that's usually related to the exhortation. So it's kind of summing it up and 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 um, confessing the sin that we discussed in the exhortation. And then there's a time for silent confession, and we could leave any amount of time because we all have a lot of sin uh, that we could probably drudge up and confess. But the the idea um, that we want to that, that that we want our folks to have about about worship is that worship is this is the center of our week. It's the pinnacle of our week. The rest of our week flows from the rest of our life flows from what happens on Sunday morning. And we're not saving up our sin, uh, for Sunday, right? That's not, like, we actually want every day to have a, 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 uh, this covenant renewal sort of pattern to it. Like, like every day we want to have this kind of thing happening, um, in our lives, in our homes, individually, and as a family. And so we're not, we're confessing our sin, um, all the time. We're praying all the time and we're not saving our sin for Sunday. And that's when we're going to confess it. Um, we believe that in the priesthood of all believers, we believe that all, all of God's people have access to the father, uh, uh, through the spirit, uh, and in prayer. And so you can and should, and are encouraged to, to take this model kneeling and, and being contrite before your, the Lord over your sin and, and apply that all day, every day. And so we're not, we don't leave 10 minutes or 20 minutes or whatever, you know, during that time of confession, but it's usually like a minute. And the idea is that you're confessing, you know, if, if the exhortation reminded you of, of an unconfessed sin in that particular area, confess it. That's kind of already happened corporately. But then, but then if there's anything that you've left out, uh, if there's anything that any sin that's perhaps happened this morning that you haven't confessed, then that's, that's an appropriate time to do that. So that's the next phase of, uh, of the worship service. And then, uh, oh, I've got a little baby that's that's come into my office. Uh, let me close my door here. One one quick second. Okay, the joys of working from home. You get these fun little interruptions from time to time. Um, okay, so um, the um, so that's the next phase is confession. We're not saving it up f- from the week. We're 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 dealing with whatever unconfessed sin we we have at that moment. Um, and then we're rising for the assurance of pardon. And so again, the assurance from pardon is some. Um, scripture and and I should mention that that by this point in the worship service we have read scripture uh, in our a call to worship. Um, we have heard a, a message taught from scripture about uh, in the exhortation. Um, as we kneel in our prayer of confession, we open that prayer of confession with with uh, scripture. Um, and every week it's different. We work through a lectionary, which means we're trying to work through the entire Bible. Um, it takes us two years, but we go through the entire Bible. And so there's a temptation, I think, of, for all of us, partially just laziness, but also we all have our favorite passages that we like to you know, appeal to, and, and we're not necessarily uh, appealing to all of Scripture. We're not teaching the full counsel of God. By working through a lectionary, um, which is something that the church, most of the church has done also, you know, historically they preach through the lectionary, um, and they read through the lectionary throughout the, the year. Uh, we're trying to do the same thing. So, so our this is this just happens to be uh, this just happens to be our, our service from from uh, from um, Sunday. And I'm gonna just read the passages. So just just to give you an example of what we're talking about. So our first passage um, in the call to worship was Psalm. Uh, 76, uh, verses one through seven. This is kind of a longer passage. Sometimes they're longer, sometimes they're, they're shorter. Um, but this is, uh, this is the, um, the call to worship this week was in Judah. God is known. His name is great in Israel. His abode has been established in Salem, his dwelling place in Zion. There he broke the flashing arrows, the shield, the sword, and the weapons of war. 
Glorious are you, more majestic than the mountains full of prey. The stout-hearted were stripped of their spoil. They sank into sleep. All the men of war were unable to use their hands. At your rebuke, O God of Jacob, both rider and horse lay stunned. But you, you are to be feared. Who can stand before you once your anger has been roused? So seven verses. That was a longer passage, but that was the that was the call to worship verse. So um, you know, we want our worship service to be just completely soaked in Scripture, and we don't want to just always go back to our favorite verses. We actually want to be preaching from the whole counsel of God. So when we went into our um, confession, as we started to pray before we prayed our prayer of confession, we re- we read uh, from from psalm 85 verses 1 through 7 and this is this is uh, these are those words lord you are favorable to your land you restored the fortunes of jacob you forgave the iniquity of your people you covered all their sin you withdrew all your wrath you turned from your hot anger restore us again O god of our salvation and put away your indignation towards us will you be angry with us forever will you prolong your anger to all generations will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you. Show us your steadfast love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. So that was our uh, our our verse before our prayer of confession, and then our um, our uh, verse for the assurance of pardon. So after we confess our sin, we ask everyone to rise to hear the the assurance of pardon. It's the good news. Uh, and so our, our verse before we give the assurance of pardon this week was uh, Isaiah 33, verse 22, which says, For the Lord is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver, the Lord is our king, he will save us. And then the words of, uh, and the words are, um, you know, it's different depending on who's leading. I'm not an ordained minister, I'm an elder, so I don't say as a minister, um, of Christ, I, I declare to you now that your sins are forgiven through Christ. I I, I approach it from a, I I use the basis of Scripture and say um, Scripture uh, tells us that if we uh, confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And on the basis of God's promise, I declare to you that your sins are forgiven through Christ. And the whole congregation responds joyfully, "Thanks be to God." So. So our sin is dealt with there at the very beginning of the worship service, and um, and so now we've been we've been called by God, and we've been we've been cleansed of our sin. Um, then we confess uh, we confess our faith together, um, and so um, we put this during the right after the confession of sin. We confess our faith. We uh, alternate every year between uh, the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed. Perhaps we'll do other creeds, um, but but we love what we love about these creeds is that they're creeds that virtually all people on the planet who who identify as Christians um, can agree with and and would would affirm. And the, these go back to these are the fundamentals of the faith. And so I'll read the the Apostles' Creed for your for your benefit. I believe in God the Father Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ His only begotten Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Ghost and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into Hades. On the third day, he rose again from the dead, ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. So the whole congregation reads that together. We're confessing together our faith. If you confess me before men, you know, I will I will confess you before the Father, Christ says. Um, and so this is all of God's people confessing him and the truth of who he is and 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 their belief in him. Um if you're if you're uh if you grew up in certain parts of the church, you hear that word a holy Catholic church and it gives you trigger it triggers you. Um uh Catholic, it's a small C Catholic there. It's the word means universal. Um, we're not going to change the creed because some people misunderstand the word. We're just going to teach what the word means. Um, so this is, this has no, this has nothing to do with the, uh, Roman Catholic church. We're just confessing, um, that we believe in the Holy ghost and the Holy Catholic church. We believe in one, one, um, the Nicene creed talks about, um, I believe one faith, one baptism for the remission of sins. So, so we, we believe that there's one church there's one bride of Christ. Um, not many brides. 
So we confess our, our faith together. We sing again. So this is the third. We sang um, uh, when we started after during the call. We sang as we prepared our hearts for um, for confession this week. We sang uh, before thee let my cry come near, which is uh, to prepare our hearts for um, for worship. Um, and that is uh, from Psalm uh, one nineteen. Um, so. And then, so we've, we've read a lot of scripture. We've sung some scripture now. Um, and, uh, we're singing again. We sing bless the man that fears Jehovah, which is also, um, um, which is also scripture. It's just pretty much straight scripture. Um, uh, bless the man that fears Jehovah and that walketh in his ways. Thou shalt eat of thy hands labor and be prospered all thy days. Um, that is from, is it Psalm 111? Uh, like a vine about thy table, uh, your children shall compass your table around. Anyway, um, I'm not finding off the top of my head the scripture, Psalm 128. So 128, that's what we were singing there. So we've now recited a lot of scripture, read a lot of scripture, prayed scripture. We've, we've sung scripture. Um, and now we move into the third C, which is consecration and consecration is where God. So now, now our sins been dealt with, we've been called and now, uh, God comes and, and speaks and, and, and consecrates us, um, through his word. He transforms us through the preaching of his word. And so this is where we sit and we hear a sermon. Um, and, um, yeah, there's not a lot to say about this other than than this that that's what's happening uh, during this part of the service. Um, uh, we we conclude uh, the the sermon um, um, with uh, actually I'm sorry I'm I'm jumping ahead. So we actually this is not the sermon. Consecration is where we we hear God's word read. Um, so we, we all rise, we all stand for the reading of God's word. So again, posture is important. God speaking, we're going to stand out of reverence for his word. And, uh, and then someone comes up and reads from the, the old Testament and the new Testament. Um, and so we have, uh, and these are longer passages, so I won't read through them, but, but we read out of second Samuel 22 verses one through seven. And then we read from acts 16 verses 25 through 34. So again, we're working through a lectionary, so we're, we're not cherry picking our favorite verses and our favorite passages to preach on over and over and over. We're actually working our way over the course of two years through the entire Bible. Um, we don't read every single word from every single from the entire Bible, um, but we're working through a lectionary that's taking us through the whole Bible. And that's where these passages are coming from. They're coming out of those those readings for that week. Um so all so the word is read and uh, the, at the conclusion, uh, whoever reads it says the word of the Lord and all of God's people say thanks be to God. And then we sit for corporate prayer, and so this is this is part of um, this is this is part of the work of you know my my house will be a house of prayer. Um, it says uh, in scripture and and um, and we think this is part of, again, part of the work of the people, you know, all of this has been the work of the people, but this is, you know, praying and interceding, uh, is huge, um, in the church. And, and it's, a, and, and we feel like Sunday morning stuff is getting done. Like this isn't like, um, a, a concert. This isn't passive. Like there's work that's getting done. This is, this is God's people storming the gates of hell. Um, as Jesus said, um, we would do. And so this isn't, this isn't a, this is our, this is Christian warfare, uh, worship is. And, and so God's people, the prayers of a righteous man are effectual, uh, availeth much. And, um, and God's people have been made righteous, you know, through, through, um, the cleansing of their sins and the consecration of his word. And so, so we're now coming we're, with clean hands, ready to, to offer our, our prayers to Lord. So we have three prayers and three different men in our worship service. Members of our church will, will come up and, and give a, a one, a prayer of Thanksgiving, excuse me, first a prayer of praise, then a prayer of Thanksgiving. And we want to get specific in our Thanksgiving. So we want to thank God specifically for things he's done 
in our midst. Um, it's not just a generic, thank you, God, that you're great. Um, uh, it's, it's thank you for hearing our prayers about this, that, and the other, uh, um, being grateful and, and, and remembering the, his good deeds, the things that he's done for his people. Um, and then, and then it's our prayer petitions. And usually the, the petition prayer is longer and we're really trying to get work done there. I mean, so we're praying through, uh, specific things. Um, we'll pray for usually a local elected leader. We'll pray typically for a church, uh, frequently a church in our town, another church and for their leaders. We will pray, uh, for the sick in our midst. We'll pray for the, uh, expecting mothers in our, in our midst, We'll pray for, um, for we frequently prayed for unbelievers, specific by name, family members who have left the faith or are wandering from, from the flock, praying that God would bring them back. Um, and so there's, there's a, these are real prayers. We actually, on our video, um, our habit has been to, to mute the microphone during this, this prayer because we, because, um, it's public. Anybody can come to our worship service and hear these prayers, but it's not, we're not announcing this to the whole world necessarily. These are, these are, there are a lot of, we're dealing with a lot of specific things. Some of those are things that only are, are sort of private to the, the, the church. Um, so, so that's why we do that uh, the way that we do it. Um, so after the prayer, we sing again. So we've now, we've read scripture many, many times. We've sung scripture many, many times. Um, We've prayed scripture. Oh, I should mention all three of those prayers. Um, we give uh, those men that are praying a passage of scripture from that week's lectionary that relates to the prayer that they're praying. So there's a prayer of praise verse or passage. There's a prayer of Thanksgiving passage, and there's a prayer of petition passage. So all three of those prayers are also starting their prayer with scripture. Um, and again, we're not cherry picking their scripture from this week's lectionary reading. So, so we're really getting lots of reps in just hearing God's word um, and all of God's word, not just our, our favorite stuff. So we've heard a lot of scripture. We've prayed a lot of scripture. We've sung scripture. Uh, we'll sing again after the, the, the prayer, uh, the corporate prayer. And then that's where the sermon happens. So the sermon happens. We sit and we're taught um, by a pastor and then, uh, and then we bring our offerings. So this is all still under the heading of consecration. Um, we're bringing our offerings to the Lord. Uh, bringing an offering is a big deal. You know, I'm I'm a big fan of encouraging people to to as frequently as they can have an offering uh, to to bring. Um, and so sometimes it's difficult um, practically, but um, but if you can, you know, if you can write a weekly check or a biweekly check if you're doing checks. Um, people give online. I'm not going to blast them for giving online. I, I completely understand the convenience of it, but there's something, you know, there's something I want to participate in that part of the worship service. And, and so knowing that I'd put a, a, a tithe check in that, um, basket, um, before the worship service and knowing like, as we're, as we're, um, singing, so we'll sing and we sing, uh, uh, a song, Holy, 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 uh, which, which is also mostly scripture. Um, we'll sing that as the offerings being brought forward. We don't pass around a plate. Um, so a lot of churches will pass a plate around. We don't pass a plate around cause we, it, this isn't a, I feel like that's a high pressure sort of sales closing tactic. And that's not the point. The point is that the Lord loves a cheerful giver, um, this is, we're not going to pressure you into, uh, pu- and also we're told not to let your right hand know what your left hand's doing when it comes to giving. And so I don't know how you do that when, when everyone's eyes are open and the plates being passed around and you can see who's put money in and who, ha- who hasn't. And so we're, we're not going to do that. Uh, we're going to take the Lord, the Lord's commandment seriously to, to, uh, to not, you know, um, you know, roll out our righteousness for everyone to see, uh, but, but to give privately, um, and, uh, and, and we're not going to pressure people to do it. Um, and so we have a basket out front, people come and when you show up to church, you drop your, your check in there. And then during this time, all of those are brought forward, um, and set at the, the, the altar that, at, at the foot of the, the, um, 
lectionary or, or whatever you want to call it, the podium. Um, so that, uh, happens actually the, um, yeah. And then, and then we pray again in our prayer, uh, after the offering is the Lord's prayer. We'll pray the Lord's prayer. Um, Jesus told us this is how you should pray. And so we pray, uh, and he didn't say only do this once a, a year or once a month or whatever, you know, we sh- there's no reason not to, we should pray the way he taught us to pray on Sunday mornings. It's a good reminder of how we ought to pray. And then we move into communion. This is the, the fourth C, uh, four, and, and this corresponds with, uh, the peace offering. Um, it's called the Eucharist, the, the thanks, uh, Thanksgiving. Um, the peace offering is the one offering where the worshiper, uh, in the old Testament where the worshiper himself would, would, would eat, would share, basically share a meal with God. Um, and so, uh, where the other, the other, um, offerings, that wasn't the case, the peace offering this was. So, so this corresponds with that, with that, uh, offering. And obviously Christ commands us to, uh, to, um, whenever we're gathered together to, to, um, to do this. Right. And so we believe that, that this is an essential, if not the most essential part of the worship service. Um, um, you know, a lot of churches throughout history have, have viewed, you know, other worship services as just prayer services. Um, but what happens on Sunday is the, the Eucharist, you know, the table, the Lord's table, and, and it's a special worship service. Um, and so, uh, we believe it's supposed to happen as frequently as the church is, is, is worshiping God, uh, on the Lord's day. So that's, that's what we do. We do it every single week. Um, there's always a word that accompanies, um, the, uh, uh, communion. And so it's never just, uh, it's never just, um, flippantly done. You know, there's always a word of encouragement, exhortation, explanation about communion uh, before we take communion. Um, a couple things to point out here. So we don't, we don't at our church view communion as a time for morbid introspection. It's not a time where you dim the lights and everybody kind of goes into a, a quiet place internally and thinks about their sin or thinks about God. Um, it's a table. Uh, and, it, and, and, you know, Jesus patterned this for us in scripture. He, he gathered his 12 disciples. They sat around a table and they, and he passed out bread. He passed out wine. He didn't say everybody take a moment to pause and reflect and think. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a feast. It's a celebration. Um, it's, it's the family table of, of God's people. And so we treat it that way. So it's not a, it's a joyful time. Um, it's not a somber, uh, time. Um, part of that tradition come in the reform world, at least comes out of the, uh, the interpretation of, of, uh, exam of self-examination that, that in, in, uh, first Corinthians 11, um, the passage about, um, uh, examining yourself. Um, I won't get into that here, uh, but suffice it to say, I don't believe, I personally don't believe, uh, in, uh, that the way that that is applied and taught, uh, in most church, in a lot of reformed churches is, is, is totally accurate with what is being taught. If you're reading those passages, uh, in context, uh, with sincerity, you, you would see that that the main aim of of uh, Paul in those passages is there's division happening in the church, um, and uh, he's he's basically saying this is one table, this is the Lord's table. We're not going to divide here. We're not going to have rich people and poor people and Jews and Gentiles eating separately. Um, and if you're doing that, um, you're eating and drinking condemnation on yourself. This is the Lord's table. None of that here. Um, so it's a sin that's, that's, uh, that, um, of, of exclusion and, and Christ is, uh, saying, this is my table. I'm not excluding anybody. Um, this is, this is, you know, this is for God's people. Um, so at our church, we do, we do say, if you're a, if you are baptized, you're welcome. You're part of God's family. And if you're not under church discipline, if you're under church discipline, um, if, if you, if you're visiting and you're at another church where you, that you've been, um, 
you've been asked by your session, by your elders, not to take communion because you're under discipline, then don't take communion. But otherwise, you're welcome. Um, and we've had people, you know, who haven't been baptized, who didn't didn't catch that. You know, we don't think that they're eating and drinking condemnation because I don't think that's, again, what's in view there. It's not, hey, if you screw this up, then God's going to strike you dead. Um, it's talking about a, a, a particular sin uh, that, that Christians commit of excluding people from God's table. And if you're doing that, then yes, you absolutely are um, um, inviting his wrath. Um, but, but, um, but we've also had people who thought they were Christians, you know, who have taken communion and, and then through teaching, uh, I've learned, oh, I'm not, I don't think I am a Christian or, I'm, or, uh, you know, I've been baptized, but I was baptized in the Mormon church and that wasn't a legitimate Christian baptism. Um, so, so there, there's a, this is an opportunity to, 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 for God to set the boundaries of whose people are and, and, and so one of the things I always do, and I encourage my kids to do, you know, I, you know, as the bread's being passed, as the wine's being passed, I'm saying, Hey, this is God's body. And look, who, who are, who are your brothers and sisters? Uh, you're part of this loaf. Like we are the bread. We, we are the body of Christ. We and discerning the body is looking around and discerning. These are all your people. Even the ones that sit over there that we hardly ever talk to, they're, they're part. They're your brothers and sisters in Christ too. And so we're we're heads up looking around um, because we think that's a big part of what God's doing here is He's knitting us together into uh, into one people, into one body through uh, this meal. And so we think that's important. Teach that it's a joyful feast. Um, we also serve bread and wine. We don't serve crackers. Uh, we have juice available. Um, it's juice for, for those with dietary and, and we also have gluten-free bread. So available in the back, uh, we want to accommodate dietary problems, uh, allergies, etc. Um, we also want to accommodate people whose consciences are bound. Um, I would, I would, uh, I would disagree with somebody who views, uh, alcohol as, uh, sinful. Um, and I could point to all over scripture to make that case. Um, but we're not going to set that as a as a barrier to entry. You can't you can't be a part of this church or worship with us if and and celebrate communion with us if if you hold that view. You're wrong. I believe you're wrong. But I'm but I'm I still want you at the table. I'm not going to exclude you because of that. That said, um, the normal we want we want to encourage our people to to simply obey Christ. Um, and and this is a real challenge in a lot of churches is they want to innovate. They always want to go well how can we make it more meaningful, right? Like, yeah, yeah, Christ broke bread and he, and he passed it around and they ate it and, and, and passed around a cup. But like, like, couldn't we make it more special and emphasize certain things more by, by, by doing this or that or the other? And our, our de facto response is no. Like, do you think you have, a, do you think the God of the universe didn't know what he was doing when he instituted the way he instituted it? Like, don't innovate. Like do it the way that as cl- as best as we can. Let's try to be as close to what God did, uh, what Christ did. So, like we 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 actually have pre cut up little pieces of bread in a in a in a plate. Um, I don't even really love that. I mean, it's it's a practical thing, so I'm I'm obviously okay with it. But I w- I would love for us to have loaves of bread and break them and pass them, right? Because that's what Jesus did. So I, w- I want as best I can. And we do have a, have a loaf up front that the pastor breaks and he does. Um, he does take from it. Um, and so I, I think that's important. Um, anyway, I, I, the point I'm trying to make is that I think it's important to try to stick as close as we can. So when it comes to what do we drink, we drink wine because that's what Jesus, that's what Jesus told us to drink. Um, his first miracle, um, was, was, uh, turning water into wine, uh, at a festival, at a party, um, and, uh, and, and this is one of the last things he told us to do is to, 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 uh, share wine together at a feast. Um, and so, um, so we, we want to encourage everyone to, to take wine unless there's a, there's a reason there's a, there's a, a, a conscience issue or a, a dietary issue. And so that includes the kids, you know, we, we, um, one of the ways are, you know, I think some kids maybe don't like the taste of wine. Uh, we're actually going to try to get one of the things we've talked about just recently is getting s- sweeter wine so that it's more appealing to the kids. 
Um, I think some of the kids are just taking juice because they like the juice. We put a little ring of, of juice in the middle of the tray. But we want to encourage the kids to take wine. And, and at our house, what we've done in our Sabbath dinners, which happen on Saturday nights, we've um we've uh we we um we pour little small glasses little little small glasses of wine for the kids as a way to to sort of say hey this is a special special thing that we do this again this is a reflection this is the beginning of the sabbath and this is a reflection of the lord's table um and so um so anyway we want to encourage people to to take wine um unless you've got a really good reason not to um it's like uh it's like having bad manners you know it's like if you go to someone's house and they offer you food and you go oh i don't really like that it's like don't do that christ offered you bread and he offered you wine be a good guest and accept the food and the the meal that he's offered you and 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 uh so anyway i'll stop i'll stop preaching on that we close with the doxology we stand and we lift our hands and again, coming back to the posture thing, our body matters. And, um, and so we lift our hands because we ought to lift our hands. We're commanded in scripture over and over to lift your hands in worship. And so we do that every Sunday. And it's not a spontaneous, um, you know, fit of emotion that's, that's leading me individually to lift my hands. Um, but it should, it should be that, right? It's sh- like, I'm lifting my hands because this is what scripture tells me to do. And this is what we do as a church. Um, but also as I'm doing it, um, my posture is affecting my heart and, and my frame of mind. And it should be a time of joyful praise uh, to God um, and thanksgiving to God. And so, um, so yeah, that's why we do that with our posture. And we sing, we sing in our church uh, psalm, um, We've, we've just switched from one psalm to another, but we sing a psalm and we actually sing it in rounds. So we're, so it's, it's really, it's really lovely. And then it ends with a, with a charge, you know, which is a, and this is the end, the commissioning. Um, this is where, this is kind of the great commission. This is where God has now changed us, equipped us, um, um, dealt with our sin. And now he's sending us out into the world. This is the, the commissioning portion. And so the charge is usually a, 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 a recapitulation of the application from the sermon. Um, and then there's a benediction and it's also from scripture. Um, and, uh, uh, this week's benediction was from Psalm 121 verses seven and eight, which is the Lord, the Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He shall preserve thy soul. The, the Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. Um, so that's our worship service. I didn't mention that, you know, if, if we have new members joining, that's, we work that into the worship service. It's not a sacrament or anything, but it's, it's part of our worship service when that happens. And then we also have, uh, obviously baptism, which is a sacrament and, um, we baptize people during the worship service. Um, so I'll, uh, I'll stop there. I know this is a fairly long, uh, episode, but I, I wanted to kind of work all the way through and try to give some thoughts on, uh, on every aspect of the worship service. Uh, if, uh, you stuck with it all the way here to the end, I, I hope that was helpful for you. Maybe it just raised a lot more questions than it answered. Uh, but maybe it got the conversation started. If you've got thoughts, questions, uh, of course, you know where to find me, uh, drop a comment or, or send me a message and, uh, thanks for tuning in to, uh, to the show. We'll see you next time. 